without an understanding of this and of the atmosphere surrounding events, there's no real understanding of what happened or why. By the time the Democratic Party gathered for its national convention in Chicago, the summer of 1968, the atmosphere was as charged as before a violent storm. Millions of Americans watched in horror as the tragedy unfolded on television. They were already in a state of stunned disbelief, of grief and apprehension after a series of national tragedies. 1968 had been one of the darkest years since the founding of the nation. In January in Vietnam, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese unleashed the Tet Offensive, and the month of brutal fighting that followed filled the home screens of America. Night after night, television brought the butchery of war into the living room. On April 4th in Memphis, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Riots broke out in more than 100 cities. 46 people were killed, 10 of them in Washington. The flames beyond the Capitol could be seen from the White House and, of course, on television. Then, on the morning of June 6th, the country awoke to the news that Senator Bobby Kennedy's brief, meteoric career had been snuffed out by still another assassination. By the end of June, the war in Vietnam had already lasted longer than any war in U.S. history. By the time of the convention in August, 27,000 Americans had been killed in Vietnam. Chicago, 1968, by producer Shana Gazit. In 1968, Chicago won a significance beyond time and place, an observer wrote. It became an event in history, like Waterloo or Versailles or Munich. As the nation watched in rage and disbelief, there were those who wondered whether the democratic process itself was being torn apart. much like any other convention, part circus, part celebration. But underneath the fanfare, fury over the war in the jungles of Vietnam would unleash a struggle for control of the Democratic Party. My main memory of 1968 that it was crowded and noisy and smoky and turbulent, and at any minute I expected somebody to punch me in the nose. The leading candidate was Hubert Humphrey. As Lyndon Johnson's vice president, the nomination should have been his for the taking. But when he arrived in Chicago, many questioned whether he could hold his party together long enough to win the election. Well, say, good to see you. Great. Humphrey wanted to be president worse than anything in the world. He had dreamed of it all his life. And throughout his career, you see this enormous drive to uh, become president and, and to get to the top of the political heap. As vice president and as candidate, Humphrey could not free himself from the grip of the president. One place and one person dominated my life that election year, Humphrey wrote. The place, Vietnam. The person, Lyndon Johnson. Everyone knew Humphrey as the president's man, a captive candidate. When he first went to the ranch after he became Johnson's running mate, uh, the first thing Johnson did was put him on a horse with a big Stetson and uh, showed that he was Johnson's property, basically, and who was dominated in every way by Johnson. Uh, Mr. Vice President, in what ways do you disagree with President Johnson's positions with reference to Vietnam? Well, would you mind if I just stated my position on Vietnam? Because the President of the United States is not a candidate, and I did not come here to repudiate the President of the United States. I want that quite clear. Publicly, Humphrey was supporting Johnson's war policies. He could not forget the president's reactions months earlier when he had tried to carve out his own position on Vietnam. 
I recall waiting for him to come back uh, late in the evening to see what happened. And uh, he came back and uh, washed his hands obsessively in the washroom and, and uh, didn't want to tell me. Well, finally, he told me that uh, President Johnson had berated him, said that he would cause the death of his son-in-law and other American boys in Vietnam if he broke with the Johnson policy. Johnson would have to publicly attack him as expedient and, and trying to hurt uh, his own efforts toward peace. Humphrey backed down. It was the price he would have to pay for the nomination. In 1968, a president still controlled the nominating process. So if Humphrey had wanted to uh, denounce the war policy or um, announce his opposition to it, seven, Johnson could have retaliated by denying them, him the nomination, and I have no doubt that he would have. When Humphrey chose to play by the rules, he became the representative of Johnson's war. What he failed to calculate was the force of opposition building within his own party. Challenging Humphrey were delegates led by anti-war candidate Senator Eugene McCarthy. McCarthy had based his entire candidacy on his opposition to the war. On the convention floor, his forces would lead a battle, an insurrection against party regulars for the soul of the Democratic Party. In the streets of Chicago, another rebellion was taking place. Young people from all over the country had been arriving in the city. They had come to demand an end to the war. Coordinating the demonstrations was a coalition of peace groups led by veteran pacifist David Dellinger. The latest supposed insight from the police is that they... If David Dellinger was the soul and the heart of the movement, a real pacifist, who believed that at some point the goodness of the American people would come forth and would force the government to stop an unjust and unmoral war. By 1968, the anti-war movement had been waging its campaign for four years. But the war kept escalating. Dellinger believed the time had come to raise the ante. We felt that we had to go from protests to resistance on a national scale because the, the war was getting, uh, expanding hor hor horrendously. There were 200 GIs coming home in body bags every week and uh, somehow we had to stop it. The demonstrators feared that the convention would be a rubber stamp of the Johnson war policies and they wanted a massive and highly visible show of opposition. You'd have to ask why the Democrats, not the Republicans. Um, partly because we were the children of the Democratic Party. We were the children of the Democratic ideal. We expected nothing from Republicans. We expected everything from Democrats. To organize the protest, Dellinger had recruited Rennie Davis, a longtime activist, and one of the most influential leaders of the anti-war movement, Tom Hayden. Though considered a militant by many, Hayden had agreed to keep the Chicago protest peaceful. Political pigs, your days are numbered. We are the second American revolution. We are winning. Yippee! Also in Chicago were the Yippies, a fringe group led by Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin. Their outlandishness appealed to young people already in revolt against what they called white bread America. Mr. Hoffman, why are the yippies here? Abby. Abby, why are the yippies here? Well, that's, uh, since we're not a uh, carefully structured organization, you'd have to ask each person. Hoffman and Rubin had splashed onto the scene in the fall of 1967, announcing that they planned to levitate the Pentagon. The Pentagon is going to rise into the air. And when it gets about 300 feet in the air, it's going to start to vibrate slowly at first and then a little quicker and all the evil spirits are going to pour out. The Pentagon's a very evil... Abby Hoffman was a kind of world-class character. A true believer that if you said it loud enough, funny enough, and wild enough, you'd get people to listen and maybe P.T. Barnum-like. There was a sucker born every minute. He was going to rope them in for good causes in his mind. <laughs> 
but he was a character. Together, Hoffman and Rubin became darlings of the media. Months before the convention, Hoffman and Rubin had turned their public relations savvy to Chicago. And for that, they invented the Yippies. Yippie was born in a kind of dope dream. And as they sat around, getting high, they started playing around with words and came up somehow with Yippie. Yippie, Youth International Party. Yippie, Yippie I O K I E. And they were off and running. The Yippies saw Chicago as their ultimate stage for political theater. In a typical irreverent gesture, the Youth International Party would run a pig for the presidency. And they announced that they were planning to bring half a million people to Chicago for a festival of life. The festival of life sounded like anything and everything cutting loose, from nude swimming in Lake Michigan to cavorting at all hours in the parks to sharing dope all night, all day long. They wanted a permit to put on their anarchist ball. The Yippie request outraged Chicago's mayor, Richard J. Daley. The mayor was one of the most powerful Democrats in the country, and President Johnson was counting on Daley, a law and order man, to keep control of the convention. Mayor Daley was really the last of the great old big city titans. Um, he was unlike anybody else in the country at the time. He was in charge. Daly had a national convention to run, but now his city was facing the prospect of thousands of hostile demonstrators, and the yippie tactics were only fueling his anxiety. The types of threats that are made are absolutely preposterous but just as absolutely believed by the populace and by the mayor. They talked about dumping LSD in the water filtration plant. They were going to get the whole city high. We're going to run away with the daughters of convention delegates. Sometimes they said they'd have huge nude-ins at Lake Michigan. They were going to break windows and turn over automobiles and use Molotov cocktails. They didn't really digest each and every one of these threats, but I think a siege mentality set in. By mid-July, the protesters had repeatedly sought permits for their demonstrations. But the city was stalling. They, they wanted to be able to do anything that they wanted to do. They wanted to march in the street. Uh, they wanted to block traffic. Uh, they wanted use of the parks all night when the law was that the parks have to be clear at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, they, they just didn't want any law to apply against them. They wanted to cause trouble. It was as obvious as the nose on your face. Daly was gambling that without permits, there would be no demonstrations. But the protest leaders had come too far to turn back. We are pressing to be able to talk with the mayor and to hope that he will come to his, uh, shall I say, good senses and to grant the permits for the kind of activity that uh, it is absolutely necessary take place during a convention in wartime. With just a month to go and still no permits, a desperate Rennie Davis reached out to Roger Wilkins at the Justice Department. And I sit down across from this fella who looks just like all those kids who went to the University of Michigan with me in the 50s. So you wonder whether it's a put on. My purpose was to really persuade him that we really wanted a large mobilization, which meant for us that it had to be peaceful. I talked to him for a long time, trying very hard to listen deep under his words. I just got a sense of a person who was telling me the truth, who was truly concerned, um, who had actually made real efforts to engage the city. Wilkins agreed to approach the mayor. We went in to see Daly, and I began to tell him about the conversation that I'd had with Rennie. And about five minutes into the conversation, 